Good evening, UK Crime Book Club. Um, myself and Julie Anderson have just been chatting away so much that we've just realised it's seven o'clock, so we thought we might as well come and join you. So, Julie, <laughs> do you want to introduce yourself and your books and just talk a little bit about Oracle and um, Plague as well, if you want to? Um, okay, right. Well, my name is Julie Anderson. Um, uh, some of you um, watching this will already know me and, and have read my books. Uh, for those of you who don't, um, I write a series about um, an investigator called Cassandra Fortune, who's um, a Whitehall civil servant, but she's managed to get herself a, a really plum job working for the prime minister, being sent all over the place doing glamorous and exciting things, which are also dangerous. Um, uh, and um, the first of the books, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> the first of the books that I, I wrote about her was called Plague, uh, which came out last year. Um, and in that, um, she uh, went through a, an investigation into a series of, of, of uh, rather horrible deaths in, in London um, and was linked with, that were linked with Parliament. Uh, and at the end of it, she got this wonderful job working for the Prime Minister. So her first mission working for, for the PM is she sent to Delphi in Greece to a conference. And that is what takes place in this, which is Oracle. Um, and it's it's called Oracle because it's set it, uh, near the the Temple of Apollo um, at Delphi, which has been um, a place of worship for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, and um, uh, on I think it's that her her second day there, a body is discovered in the temple, laid out like an offering to the gods, and Kathy Kathy gets drawn into it. So. Um, uh, this is, if you like, the further adventures of, of Cassandra Fortune. I've just seen uh, Pat there. Is that Pat? It is Pat. Pat she's found hi, us. Hi, hi Pat. <laughs> Good evening. Um, and uh, before I wrote the um, contemporary crime novels, I wrote uh, historical adventure stories um, set in southern Spain uh, called Reconquista and the Silver Rings, set in medieval. I, I wasn't uh, pronouncing that correctly. You were close. You were close. I was not um, close. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that that I wrote those for they're, they're sort of young adult stories. I, I wrote those a number of years ago. Um, but as as Sam and I were, were were talking before we actually switched switched the live button on, um, uh, in a, in a way, even though I write contemporary books now, there's an awful lot of history in them anyway. Um, and um, uh, Oracle is the second uh, Cassandra Fortune book. Uh, the first is Plague, and the third, which is called Opera, I'm working on at the moment, and that's scheduled to come out, uh, published by Claret Press, um, sometime next year. So, can you tell us anything about it yet? How far in are you? Um, I've got to a page, I think it was 180 this afternoon. So, I'm, I'm, up, I'm up to about 65,000 words. Um, so, um, I suppose... Mm, three quarters, two thirds, three quarters of the way through. Um, but but it it's the first draft, and um, I mean, essentially, what what I'm doing is I'm I'm making the dough with which I will make the bread or the cakes later, um, because um, I, I mean that's how I work anyway. Get it down on paper and get all my themes lined up and all my characters and and what's going to happen, and then and then start shaping it. In the way that if you make a croissant or a brioche or a you know a, a fancy pastry, you have to start with the dough, the dough first, and then bend it into shape. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. I'm assuming that um, hi Pat, she's waving at us. Hello. Oh, hi. I'm assuming I was right. I was assuming that greetings was Jason Kelly, one of our lovely admins, and it hi. is. I was right. So if you see me looking down at all, it's on my phone because. Uh, we just get Facebook user for some people, but I can see them if I look at us on Facebook, which is bizarre, but it works. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Pat says she's sorry she missed where the third book is set. Ah, well, it, it's back in London. Um, Cassie comes back, um, uh, and and ha if when you when you read our Oracle, Pat, you you get to the end, and and it sort of um, tells you roughly what's going to happen well perhaps not what what's going to happen but certainly where it's going to happen next because Cassie comes back to London um hi Caroline <laughs> uh 
Hello, um, I'm not sure. Somebody's saying they can't get the link to work. Leslie Field. So, Kaz, if you can liaise with Leslie, please, seeing as you're here, um, and see if we can figure out why. So, oh, actually, I think Leslie may have figured it out. Oh. She says, cool. So, cool. I think um, listening to, hello, we've got lots and lots of people joining all of a sudden. Hi, Lucy. So, <laughs> Hi Lucy. Hi Kaz. Hi Leslie. Hi Pat. Hi Jay. So we've um yeah, we're off to a flying start. So we've been talking about all sorts for about half an hour, but well, probably longer now. Yes. <laughs> um let's talk about Cassie. Now I'm a little bit smitten with Cassie. I think she's um she's very engaging, she's very empowering. I just think she's um I just think she's fantastic. And she's, I'm never quite sure what she's going to get up to and how she's going to handle things, but I'm always impressed with how she does. So mm. tell us a bit about Cassie and where her name came from, where the idea for her came from. Right. Um, well, um, the name came um, uh, right from the beginning when I started, when I agreed with the publisher to write the, the series of, of crime stories. Mm. Because um, although I had in my head the idea that I would write the, the 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 basis for them would be set in Westminster and Whitehall and around that sort of um, the world of politics, if you like. Um, I even from the beginning, I I um, fancied setting um, uh, a story in Delphi, largely because I went to a conference at the conference centre in Delphi about twenty years ago, and um, and it is if anyone if anyone hasn't been to Delphi, it is a stunning stunning place to go it's very beautiful it's very high up in the mountains but they, you can see all the way down the valley to the sea the, the view is just remarkable and and when you're there you realize why the ancient greeks thought that the place belonged to a god the god apollo because it is so beautiful i mean you know <laughs> who else could it belong to um but i was actually there and um it was in november which is when um, Oracle is set, and uh, and Delphi is a ski resort, or there are there is a ski resort nearby in winter. So because you are very high up, and there were storms in the air, and we were actually sat in the sort of canteen of the of the conference centre, and the lights were flickering, and the the tempest was was raging outside, and somebody said uh, this would be a great place for a Poirot, you know, an Agatha Christie. And so I had in my mind from the beginning that that at some point might be the setting for one of the of Cassandra Cassandra's um, adventures, and that prompted me to think, well, why don't I give her a Greek name? Um, and and I thought, well, Cassandra, because Cassandra is a is a prophetess and can see the future, and I mean, you know, you want that a little bit of that sort of cleverness and prophetic quality in a detective. Um, but of course, she's also, I mean, the Cassandra of literature anyway, she's also a very tragic character because although she's given the power of foresight, she's also cursed by, by Apollo, um, uh, supposedly because she wouldn't sleep with him, um, um, with, with the fact that no one will ever believe her. So she's quite a tragic figure. She knows yeah. what's going to happen, but she can't help people because people won't believe her. And and I wanted my heroine to be a little bit um, not tragic so much as complex and to have her own demons and her own problems. So I thought Cassandra was a very good name uh, for her. And um, and I hope she is complex. I mean, we were we were those of you who've just arrived. Um, Sam and I were talking about this before. Um, I wanted her to be complicated, uh, and I wanted her to be very human, um, uh, because uh, some people say, and I know there is a debate currently about uh, in literature and, and crime fiction, in, in fiction generally as well, um, about um, should people have to like the main character. You know, and people have said that they said that in reviews of Oracle and and indeed of Plague. I really enjoyed this book. I thought well, this was a really good mystery, but I really didn't get on with the main character. I didn't like her. Um, and to me, that that that's not that's um, that's not a problem. That's a that's almost a good thing, because um, it means she's human. And you know, which of us 
um, doesn't, which of us is always likable all the time? Nobody, you know. So um, I wanted her to be complex and I wanted her to, to have all sorts of shades of grey. And, and I mean, she's basically a good character. She's, um, she's uh, she has tremendous integrity and principles and she's definitely on the side of the angels, you know. Um, uh, but she's also quite driven and ambitious um, and she makes uh, some very stupid choices. Um, certainly in play. Cassie's actually said something about that somewhere. We have a look. I like Cassie, but she makes odd decisions at times. <laughs> she does. She's very impetuous, um, and and she she's she's very quick thinking, but that leads her to do things sometimes that actually, if you had if you had a bit more time to reflect, you might not do. And um, I mean, there are some the of those path. in an oracle, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I wanted her to be, I wanted her to be complex. I wanted her to be a modern professional woman. Uh, you know, mm. I had, um, I did an interview with Jackie Collins recently, you know, Dr. Noir from Noir at the Bar and Newcastle yeah. Noir. And she said she really liked Cassie. Um, uh, but she also said that um, it made her think about um, professional women and how women are perceived uh, mm. these days. Uh, and she said, because, a lot of the time, I I, I found, she said to me, that I was I found her being like a bully. You know, she was she was very um, forceful and um, uh, decisive, and she'd make all sorts of decisions and just tell people what to do. And um, and Jackie said to me, but I but then I actually asked myself, if a man was doing this, if this character was male, I'd be I was saying just going to ask exactly the same leadership thing. qualities, you know, <laughs> determination, forcefulness, decisiveness. But is it because she's female that I'm I'm thinking these things? And um, if that's if that's what you know, if that what is what people are made to consider when they read it, then I, I'm 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 very pleased about that because mm. um, I think that's often the case. And any professional woman in any walk of life will tell you that. You know, there's still there's still a residue of of the fact that we have to be meek and mild. And um, you know, if we if we shout up too often or or too loudly, then we're pushy or we're a bully or whatever. Um, now, of course, there are ways of doing things, and the idea is. You know Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You know you you need to take people with you. You can't just persuade them. You have to take them with you. So uh, there is that too. But um, but I wanted Cassie to be all those things. Does that answer the question? I've gone on for ages. What a great answer. <laughs> now one of my um somebody that I know once bought me a mug that said on it, "I'm not bossy. I'm the boss." And I yeah. just thought, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And it was bright pink. Oh, and I was excellent. just like, yep, yeah, I'm I'm not a pink. I'm not a girly girl. Um even slightly there's nothing girly about me but the um yeah i liked that mm. but then again you still have to be careful i couldn't have taken that into work where i am not the boss at work <laughs> um can't use it at home because I've got to be equal with my husband so it's still it does it throws up all kinds of things but i like my mug it went through the yeah. dishwasher and it's ruined but that's just half of the course <laughs> oh, no. with me things fall on my head i ruin things oh. um, <laughs> so um Leslie managed to get the link to work. That's fantastic. Tony Millington says evening. Hello, Tony. Hi, Tony. Leslie says, I can see you as you were. Thank you, Leslie. We'll carry on. Um, Kaz says, what is Oracle about and how many books are you planning in the Cassie series? So you're ah. already working on book three. Mm. Um, do you have lots more planned, she says, with crossed fingers? <laughs> um, well, I... I originally agreed with the publisher that I'd do three. Um, uh, although we did have a we did have a pause after the first one because we didn't really know whether it would be successful or not. Um, and that given that minute. I was, sorry, we'll come to the reason for that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, we 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 weren't sure it would be successful. Um, and and whilst I mean you know it's not a bestseller or anything, but you know I was a complete unknown. Um, uh, I'd never written any crime fiction before. It was completely new to me. So we did say we might we'll have a pause after the first one. And um, uh, but in fact the publisher was very pleased, and I got a, another contract shoved under my nose almost straight away um, uh, for Oracle. And I've agreed to do a third one. And and that. As you will see, I hope when you read the third one, uh, it is very much uh, a trilogy. 
Um, but um, the end of Oracle does not end Cassie's story. Um, and and that, that's sort of all I can say about that. Um, <laughs> and yeah, there will, in my mind, in my head, I could continue to write stories uh, with Cassie um, as, as the central character. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, but uh, again, it, a lot depends on you know whether the publisher wants to publish more. Um, uh, you know what what readers want. I, I guess um, they could be tired of her by then. I hope they're not. Because um, um, having constructed a complex character, I want to, I want to carry on with her. But um, but yeah, I mean um, Oracle is the second in a trilogy. Uh, the third one is is Opera, um, which I'm writing at the moment. Uh, and and there is a there is a a real cliffhanger at the end of opera uh, and we'll see after that what happens. Um, Kaz asked, why write things in the world of politics? Oh, right. Well, um, partly because it's a world I know, uh, I guess, because I worked in Whitehall and Westminster for years, for 27 years or whatever. Um, so I I know that that's, that's the sort of milieu that, that I, I lived, you know, worked in every day, uh, and most of the time it's it's incredibly boring. Um, but some of the time it's quite exciting, and and you get to do things like go to conferences in Delphi, for example, <laughs> um, which is fun. Um, but it's sort of it it's what I can write about with lots of internal and interior knowledge. So I hope there's a sort of authenticity about it um, because. Whilst it isn't the real world, it's it's very close to the real world. It's a sort of slightly alternative reality, if you like, um, mm. uh, and it's it, it's a world that I know very well. So um, that's why I decided to set stories there. Also, it, it means you can I can deal with big ideas um, in a in a very sort of popular way. I mean, you know, I'm I'm writing crime stories. <laughs> um, these aren't you know great um, works of literature, but um, I mean, historically, people have always dealt with ideas in 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 books, in novels, anyway. Um, and I'm no different. And if you set them in the world of politics, then you've got a huge range of of um, of, of ideas you can you can choose to write about. Now, I did ask you before we went live if it was okay to ask you about releasing a book called Plague during a pandemic and the impact that it may or may not have had. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I started writing play back in 2018 when I was laid up, I had to have surgery and I, I knew that I'd be completely um, uh, immobile for a while. So I thought, well, that, that, that's the time to start. Um, uh, so it wasn't, it's, it, it's not, a, it wasn't a COVID novel, it's not a pandemic novel. In fact, there is no plague in plague. It's, it's the, the, just the, the title. Contag yeah, it's just the title. The contagion is the contagion of power and the lust for power. Um, but um, as publication day approached, I had, my publisher and I did actually sit down and, because we'd always called it plague because, you know, it's about power. So that, and, and power as a plague. And that's thought that's had been its title from the beginning, but we did sit down and say, "Can we really actually publish it with that title?" Um, and um, and we decided that that we would. Um, in part, I have to say, I think on the publishers <laughs> from the publisher's point of view, at that point, I think we were we were we were just approaching lockdown number one, so sort of March of of twenty twenty. And I think Contagion was the most watched movie on Netflix or something, you know. So people were actually seeking out um, uh, representations of plagues or pandemics or, or, or whatever. And I know um, people people do get. I know Pat, for example, who's with us, Pat Forsyth is with us tonight, has got a, 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 um, a shelf at home of plague books, you know, novels in which plagues of various kinds feature. Um, so. Uh, th there was that side of it um and also at the time we 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 didn't know i mean nobody knew um just how many people were going to die because yeah. of covid um and uh, uh, to an extent it it it, it sort of um i mean the the whole um covid lockdown uh, ruined all sorts of plans in terms of the launch for plague 
because we couldn't we couldn't do what we planned to do. And and Claret Press, who are a very small press, um, uh, but who who make up uh, in innovation what they lack in size. Um, uh, we're we're going to do things like print some some the, the first two um, chapters in a little a little sort of flyer book to hand out at Westminster Westminster Tube Station because of course that's right next to the Houses of Parliament yeah. and so on. But when you think about it, right? Well, everyone was working at home anyway, and B, even if they hadn't have been, they were not going to be taking free flyers with plague written across the top of them. You know, so um, it was. <laughs> yeah, I know it was just ridiculous. So unfortunate. Um, it was so we we sort of we couldn't do a lot of the publicity and things that we we thought we would do um and i spent a lot of 2020 saying um i started writing this book in 2018 and that was long before covid and this had nothing to do with covid or the pandemic um but but as it happens uh you know um quite a lot of books have been out um that uh, about pandemics or dystopian um futures like i mean there's e smith's the waiting rooms for example which is about the antibiotic um immunity there's um leslie kelly's health of strangers series i did i did a a session with both of those ladies and dr noir about about a, six months ago now uh discussing you know what what's happening to crime fiction in the, the age of the pandemic and, and so on so um it's it's been interesting um uh, and and I I get to talk about plague in a way that I would not have anticipated talking about plague. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. That's how it is. I know there was um, and I can't think of the title. There was another book. I'm sure somebody will tell me that um, the publisher thought was too far fetched, and it was only recently brought out. And my mind's gone completely blank. But I know somebody will know and somebody will tell me. You have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of comments and questions here. Oh, right. Um, so let's have a look. Um, Jason wants to know who has the final say on your book title. So you had quite a lot of involvement in the title of Plague. Do you, would you always have such an involvement or is it just that it was such an unusual circumstance? Um, I... I've had quite. A, it's partly because I've got a small publisher, I guess, um, and I uh, and um, which is which is the the really good side of having a small publisher. You you end up not just working with your editor, uh, but but actually with the person or one of the people who runs the firm, mm. because they're they're not that big. So I I, I had um, a lot of input in things like the titles of the books, in uh, in the covers. So the covers were actually, you know, forwarded to me when the, the, the book designer who did this and who also did Plague and who will also do um, opera is called Petya uh, Tavank. Oh, now, let me let me pronounce this correctly. Sankova. That's right. She's, a, a, I think, Russian extraction. Um, and she works for... Um, for for claret uh but it was it was nice to actually work with the designer as well and um uh she she submitted several designs and um and i was asked which one you know i preferred um now ultimately it's the publisher who makes the decision on things like that because they've got to market the the book mm. um so you know i i could I could want some wonderful line drawing or painting or something, and it would cost a fortune and it wouldn't print well. Um, so it's it's their decision, uh, really. But but it, having a having a small publisher, it, it is is or one of the benefits of having a small publisher is that you you have input into things that I suspect you simply wouldn't have if you if you published with someone like Harper Collins, unless you're you know Hilary Mantel or 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 you know um, uh, Stephen King or someone like that. Mm. One thing I will say now, I can do this tonight because I've got um, I've not put as many things on the top, so I can actually be really risky because I'm not going to knock anything on my head. The feel, and I know that nobody can nobody can feel this unless you've got a copy there, but the feel, not just of the cover, but the um, the pages and how the book is weighted, just makes it such a pleasurable pleasurable experience as long you know alongside the actual right the, the writing the reading of the story mm. it just feels very i can't describe it it's just an all-round pleasant experience 
which oh, you don't good. always get. It's a really, I'm not complaining about anybody else's books. I'm just trying to compliment yours because it's something quite special. Hmm. Oh, well, thank you. I will pass it on to Claret Press. Um, you're not you're not the only person who's to say that actually. Um, and it is something they are very they are very proud of. I mean, some of their other covers have been, you know, up for awards and things like that. So it's something that they they care about very much. Uh, that they they get it they get it right, and that it's a very classy product, if you like. Um, and I think and I think it is. I think you know I'm I'm very pleased with it anyway. Uh, so yeah. Good, I'll pass that on and they'll be very pleased. We've got, um, oh, that's David, I believe. David Gilchrist saying hello to us both. Um, and Hi. it is, yeah, and he says, do you find social media helps you? It's one of his favorite questions. Yeah. Do you do most of it yourself or, mm. you know, is it a team effort or how do you go about it? Quite a big um, job, isn't it, social media? Yeah. I, I have to say that before I became a writer, I wasn't on anything. I didn't do Twitter. I didn't do Facebook. I, you know, I, I was, um, uh, you know, they, they talk about, you know, people being first adopters or early adopters or whatever. Well, I was way behind. I, I really didn't do anything. And then I became a writer and I sort of had to start. And, and, I, and I was sat down by my publisher and told that I had to do it. Um, so I, I did, and I, I like, I quite like Twitter because it's words, and there are lots of writers on Twitter because it's words. So you know, um, uh, but I now do Facebook and and occasionally Instagram. I've got an Instagram account, my, but but basically that's me taking pictures when I go running on the common in the morning. You know, <laughs> so that that's that's the limit of my Instagram um, expertise. Um, but I do I do quite a bit on my own account um though it's also true i mean the the, the ladies at claret um julia um and uh lauren were uh, were just two but one of them one of them one of them's job was to do um uh twitter and the other one did um instagram and facebook and um and they would produce lots of lovely visuals that you know that they'd send to me and and say use this and send that out and so on so um that was that's great um and um uh, and occasionally I get I get emails sort of saying, why haven't you got more followers? You know, <laughs> what? I'm writing a book, you know, um, but you can't you can't do everything. And, and it is a huge time suck. You know, um, you, you could spend all day uh, doing your social yeah, media. Uh, and, um, and and to be absolutely honest, when you're trying to write, and sometimes it's quite hard if you don't really get in the groove, you have to mate yourself. And the temptation to just have a look at Twitter, you know, see what's going on. Uh, I have to, I have to, you know, banish that and not do it. Yeah, but yes, I mean, you, 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 David's right. It is. It, uh, it's it's very helpful actually. It, it amplifies, especially when in a time when you've not had. I've not had. The usual book signings and book tours, physical book tours, and you know the WI and book clubs and and so on. Of course, none of that's happened. Um, uh, the social media is, to an extent, I, I guess, filled the gap there in that it's it's got the word out there about the book. So it's obviously got its um, pluses, but there's downfalls with technology as well. Yeah, mm, yeah, it takes up a lot of time. And it exactly. is, it's easy to just sit down to put one post on Instagram, for example, and then three hours later you look up and you think, well, there's the morning gone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Soon. I do that. <laughs> in there. Soon eats into it. Donna Morfitt says hi to us both. Hi, Donna. Hi. Um, right, I've, I don't know what this is for. I'm trying to rack my brain. Kaz said, is that why you bought me one of those mugs? I've completely lost the train of thought as to what that refers to, Kaz. Not sure. Give me a, give me a nudge. Um, oh, right. Pat wants to know, would you bring Cassie to Scotland? Possibly. Mm. Yeah. I don't see why not. Um, my, my publisher has already suggested to me because I, I've, got, I've got an Italian agent. Um, I didn't know I had an Italian agent. Um, it was it was all done through my publisher, who's who's essentially um, signed some sort of deal with an Italian um, publicity um, publishing agency. Um, 
and uh, and and they now apparently represent me in in Italy and in Italian, um, uh, with a, with a view to having the book translated into Italian. So, so my 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 favourite, um, or rather, her my publisher's favourite tune at the moment is, um, could you could you consider um, taking Cassie to Rome, for example? <laughs> now I used to live in Rome, so oh, wow, I could do that. Um, but yeah, I I. I I can see that with the job that she has, if I carry on writing the series after three, um, you know, I could take her just about anywhere in the world, really. Uh, I mean, she'd have to come back to London because I think he has to be grounded in a in a place, and that will be yeah. London. Um, but there's nothing to stop her, as in this case, going to Delphi uh, in Oracle or taking her to, up to Edinburgh or, um, uh, you know, across, across to Italy. Sorry? Down to Manchester? Uh, well, my husband's from out of Manchester, so <laughs> oh, <best laughs> you know, at some oh. point, at some point, you never know. Because um, I got him into, I got him into play. He was, he's the man who sits on the back of the bus going into town uh, that Cassie nods to occasionally. He's, he always sits in the corner and reads the Racing Post. Um, so that's that. my, <laughs> that's my <laughs> husband. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! I didn't know that. That's brilliant. I didn't know it was based on your husband. See, I, I can. I'll stop because I'm. I'm going back. I can feel myself looking up in my head, looking for things. Yeah. So I'll stop. Um, something we talked about before we went live that I wanted to mention was um how the chapters are set out. So the book's laid out in days, which I just thought was a brilliant idea. And there's you know more than one chapter per day. Yeah. It's not yeah. So and you had a really nice compliment about that as well, didn't you? I did. I did. It was actually um, someone who read Plague and who was talking to me about it, who said that it reminded them of the TV series 24, you know, the one with Kiefer Sutherland, um, and, and which I thought was amazing because that, that series had an amazing energy and impetus and momentum and because it was, you know, 24 hours with, you know, 24 hours every sort of episode or whatever, following it, not not in real time, but in quasi real time. And and I wanted that in, in my stories. I wanted uh, that sort of energy so that, again, so it's not real time, but you have, a, you, you have the impression that, you know, there is an impetus and time is passing and, you know, the answer has, has to be found and then there's another body that turns up on the next day and, and so on. And I wanted that energy. So I was very, very pleased when when this person actually told me that he, he, he that Plague, but anyway, he'd not, I don't know whether he's read Oracle now, but um, at the time it was just Plague. He said that, that that's what that reminded him of. Um, and I thought that, oh, well, good. I've, I've done something good then <laughs> in that it's got it's got that sort of pace and that sort of uh, impetus and energy in it. Did so. you have a little silent cheer to yourself at the time and then go home and have a louder cheer? Yeah, <laughs> basically, yes. <laughs> yes. And I thought, yes, that's what I wanted. <laughs> and because I did it in, in Plague, um, and it and it I think it works. I, I've done it in in Oracle, and at the moment I'm writing opera, and I'm doing it in opera as well. So um, each story is divided into into days, although there are um, chapters. But you know, the, each day is broken down into into chapters that happen at different times of that day, um, and and that's what I'm sort of working on now. Though, uh, though there's there's a little coda in each case, isn't there? Because I mean, plague sort of finishes and then you have have the final chapter which takes place you know a week or so later after the funeral and and in oracle you have the sort of final few chapters that take place in a in athens uh, away from delphi and 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 the same will happen with uh, with opera as well so there's a sort of coda if you like in musical terms to um, to the whole book it's very very tricky to actually um to think how far into the book we can discuss without I hate spoilers so it's away. very tricky doing interviews um, one of our members Leslie Lloyd asked me a while ago and we, we talked about it and decided not to but would we um would we consider doing interviews where people had read the book so they knew there would be spoilers and I was still a bit concerned that somebody might tune in by accident not realizing yeah. Yeah. So it's a very, very tricky thing because it would be a lovely thing to do in, you know, traditional book club style. You yeah. know, people read the book and talk about it. But then yeah. with over 500 member authors as well, 
somebody's going to feel left out it's quite a tricky one well it is and I, I think I mean people have told me in all, and I've read the reviews of, of Oracle and because of course it is book number two and they've they've said that you don't have to have read book number one for it to make sense because I, I and I was quite careful to put sufficient backstory in there to allow people who came to it afresh to be able to, to to deal with that and and just read it as a standalone um but it is also true that if you haven't read plague um it you know it it, it sort of does it, it has got spoilers in it because it does refer to um the things that happened in plague that of course are part of the mystery when you're reading book number one so um and a number of people have actually said that they didn't realize it was book two um, um but they have now gone back to read book one um and I guess, well, I don't know. It would be interesting to see what they think of it when they've done that. Um, because, I mean, there's one huge giveaway, of course, in in, in Oracle, because it, it mentions... Talking about beforehand the, as well, yeah. ...the name of the villain, uh, who, of course, you, you don't really know in, until the end of, of play. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, And people said they missed him as well. They wanted more of him for some reason. But, um, yeah, it is quite difficult because of the spoilers. Yeah. Absolutely, it is. Um, Cal says, is there anyone else you would like to write with, um, especially other people who use Westminster as a location? Mm. She interviewed Peter Hayne last year and he writes a fab th um, thriller. And I did miss Tony Millington's com uh, comment that he used to work in the civil service for the MOD. So what, who's that, sorry? Tony Millington. Oh, right. Okay. So. Oh, so well, Cass well, well. Um, asked about who else you'd like to write with, especially other people who um, use Westminster as a location. Yeah, well, there are, I mean, there are lots of people who do. Um, I, I mean, a, a good friend of mine is a chap called Simon Burfan, who um, used to be, I mean, he's a, a BAFTA winning TV presenter. He, um, he, he's retired now, but um, he writes he writes some um, parliamentary thrillers. Um, uh, and he he used to be. I mean, I, if you are of a certain age, and you're probably too young to remember this, Sam, um, there was um, there was a program called World in Action that I was on World in Action. <laughs> um, good. Okay. Well, Simon Simon was their lead reporter. Right. Um, okay. So, um, so he he saw that world of politics, if you like, but from a, a journalist's point of view, mm. um, and uh, and he now writes um, sort of thrillers based in Parliament. His his latest one is now I've got to think is I think called oh dear I can't remember I'm going to have to look this up. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear me! I'm sure it will. But it's been but, put on um, the spot. It does that. It does. But his name is Simon Burton anyway, and he writes he writes very good sort of parliamentary thrillers. But um, you can tell that his background is in in journalism, whereas mine is in the civil service. Yeah. Um, and and it's nice talking to him because we we're we're sort of um, we're writing about the same milieu, but from a different slightly different perspective. Um, uh, oh dear, a, a secret worth killing for. That's what it's called. A I secret worth come killing for. <laughs> it's come to me. So I, I do talk to him uh, about his books and, and he talks to me about mine. Um, but I haven't really spoken to, to anyone else. Um, when, we, when we knew that, um, or when Plague was scheduled for release in September 2020, mm -hmm. before uh, COVID, um, uh, it was um, scheduled for release at the same time as Tom Watson's book called The House, which right, he okay. wrote with Im I'm Imogen not Robertson. With that one. Sorry, not familiar no, with it, that one. He he did it. He wrote, you know, Tom Watson, who was the deputy leader of the Labour Party for a while, um, who I knew vaguely when he was uh, chief whip, or no, working in the whip's office. I don't think he was a chief whip, but um, but. Um, he wrote a, a book with a lady called Imogen Robertson, who uh, usually writes historical um, uh, fiction, uh, who I happen to know from the time when I used to write historical fiction. Uh, and she uh, was working with Tom on a, a book which eventually be called, that was called The House. And it was uh, it was brought out last autumn. And originally they were they were supposed to come out at the same time. And we actually did talk about doing 
um, you know, some publicity together and some promotion together. But uh, as it happened, the house didn't come out till till much later, much much later than Plague. Um, but I, I I must at some point get together with Imogen and and talk about uh, her experience in writing that because of course it would have been again a different perspective, the politician's perspective uh, from from Tom Watson. Um, so that would be very interesting. Um, we've still got lots of questions, so um, I was just trying to look who this one was, but um, please can I ask, like Cassandra, some folks dismissed as bonkers conspiracy, conspiracy theorists do not believe that some could be right. I don't know who has asked that. Quite a tricky... Um, mm. Well, it is. Uh, I, well, it, I mean, to, to an extent, I guess that, that I mean that's that's Cassandra's curse, isn't it? That I, I'm not my Cassandra. I mean, you know, the the Cassandra of classical literature, in that that she can see the future. She does know what's happening, but nobody believes her. Um, and I'm sure that there are there are people today who. <laughs> <laughs> who, are, who are actually talking about things and getting it right. I mean, when you think about it, um, I don't know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, if people had actually told you that the globe was warming up um, and we were all going to have to, you know, move on to um, wind power and, and solar power and so on. I, well, I suppose 30 or 40 years ago, there probably were people doing that. But but before then, when you look back to the original sort of Gaia theories and so on of the of the 50s and 60s, I mean, these people were regarded as cranks. Um, and, and yet now everyone accepts that that's what's happening um, and that we've got to do something about it um, and change the way we live. Um, and I guess that that's that's often the case with people who are forward looking or can see what other people can't, uh, just like Cassandra, I, I, I suppose. Um, but I I I I did um I did ask in a I did a, I wrote a post recently and I asked in the UK Crime Book Club Facebook forum about politics in crime fiction and particularly the politics of policing mm. and. Um, the politicization of the police because it occurred to me that um although that that happens in, in in oracle because there's a very specific reference to the greek political situation um and a, and a, an organization called golden dawn which has subsequently been found to be a criminal organization but for, for a while was a sort of far-right party in the, in the greek um uh, parliament and a lot of police belong to that party um so there would have been all sorts of um conflicting loyalties i guess um in theory if not in practice and i wondered if uh, if if that sort of thing especially when you look at the us and you look at the way that uh, former president trump used the police in certain circumstances um you know used federal federal funds to send in private police to cities that uh, were that were democrat uh, and had lots of demonstrations and so on and you sort of think well if people are using the police as a political force um and that invariably will impact on 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 policemen and women and and their investigations and you can see that in a lot of historical fiction some of the fictions that are set in for example weimar germany um, or nazi germany uh, where you have police investigators whose whose um, uh, crime solving skills and their investigations themselves are are uh, impacted by you know the Nazis or the political situation or whatever, and a lot of people um, I asked whether people knew whether books like this were already out there, and um, interestingly one of the, the the people from the book club who answered, I think Guy, Guy Middleton is his name, said, what about G.F. Newman's books back in the 1960s and 70s? And I remember his series called Law and Order, which which caused all sorts of um, ructions at the time because it, it showed a very corrupt police force and, and a very skewed judicial system. Um, uh, but I also then, when I was doing a bit of research, came across his books uh, that were called Crime and Punishment, in which you have... Um, Believe it or not, um, uh, a Russian bank rolling the, the Conservative Party, um, and um, and um, you know uh, that the, there being, if you like, um, uh, gangsters, for want of a better word, um, running running a lot of the political system. And I thought, good lord, you know, um, that's that's not unlike plague. Um, though I hadn't read those books before, 
Um, so G.F. Newman, I think, was was quite um, um, prescient in in what he was writing back then. And of course, now we've got we've got Russian peers in the House of Lords and uh, and so on. Not that I'm suggesting that Lord Lebedev is necessarily an, um, a gangster or an oligarch or whatever. And but, on that um, note, I'm going to jump in with um, Will Templeton said the book that I was asking about before was Lockdown by Peter May. Ah. Uh -huh. Yes. Couldn't think. It just wouldn't come to me. Thank you, Will, for rescuing me. Um, and you just stopped me from libeling someone, probably. <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting. I was thinking, I don't want to be rude and jump in, but at some point I'm going to jump in. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to move on. Um, Will wants to know, do you prefer writing contemporary or historical fiction? Oh, that's very difficult. Interesting. They have very different demands. Um, Though I think even, uh, and this is something that Sam and I were talking about before we went live, um, even in my contemporary fiction, the history comes through. I can't help it. I'm I'm very interested in history. So, you know, you got that in in plague with the plague pits and 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 the lost river, and you you get it too in in Oracle with um you know the Temple of Apollo going back millennia, and also the the sort of more recent um uh, Greek past. Um, so, um. I think that you get you sort of get history either way, but they do have very different demands. Um, and um, historical fiction is interesting for different reasons, I guess. You have to put yourself in a world which is completely unfamiliar to you, mm. um, and and in in a very practical sense. So my um, stories that were set in medieval Spain they're set at a time where you know there is no electricity there you know there are no motor, there's no motorized transport obviously um, and that 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 actually um, impacts on um, on on how and what you write so um, I had to be very ke careful about writing night scenes because if if they're outside in the countryside there are no lights I mean you know if, if it's cloudy you can't see at all <laughs> because the only light that there would be would be from the moon or the stars um and and even indoors it you know if if you have your characters reading a book for example or wanting to share what's written down on a piece of paper that's actually you've got to do that during the daytime because it's incredibly difficult to do that if you've got three or four people trying to read a document by candlelight and there's no other so many things well, that I wouldn't have considered about writing diff from different eras. Mm. So it, it, mm. that there are very, very practical considerations that you have to take into account when you're when you're writing um, historical fiction and things like, I mean, um, just diet. You know, um, uh, it and the Andalusian diet the, uh, of, of the sort of 13th century. Um, uh, did have things like rice and and grain and so on no potatoes uh the potato came over from america wasn't discovered till you know 1492 so you can't have people eating potatoes um it's very it's a very specific yeah. research for your books yeah well yeah <laughs> now it's it's different with contemporary um uh, because you don't have that problem because you live in the here and now so mm. um you know you're you're translating it it's a, it's much closer it is the real world but at one remove as we were saying earlier slightly alternative reality um but there are also things i mean i was talking to a um a chap on a, a podcast uh, earlier this week armand rosamilia who writes who writes sort of horror thrillers and he sets he sets his fiction in the 1980s when he was growing up in New Jersey, um, uh, but that's because he can't cope with um, the changes in modern technology. Um, and and it, I, I've had these, I've been party to, to conversations with with um, police experts, for example, uh, mm. I, and I know that, that some of them belong to the group, um, when, um, you know, modern forensics uh, will, will help you sell, solve um, you know most crimes actually um, and uh, so as soon as you have some DNA you know if your if your perpetrator is someone who's who's done anything before um, then then you'll find him Sharp um, <laughs> uh, well yeah um, but also um, 
I had to, I, that's partly why I set Oracle um, where I did, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's two thirds of the way up Mount Parnassos, um, uh, which is, I mean, of course, it's not that isolated. Nowhere is that is that isolated apart from, you know, Antarctica or the Arctic or something these days or deep in the Amazon rainforest. Uh, it's not that isolated. But, you know, when when the storms rage and if the electricity went down, um, you can and you're in the mountains. So you haven't got a signal, a satellite signal. You you have a situation where you're creating the sort of the country house house murder mystery um, set up, if you like, as a location um, uh, that that normally you wouldn't have because, you know, you want to find something out. You look on the Internet, you know, Wikipedia. Um, it, it, it's all at your fingertips these days. Um, so that was that's quite a challenge. I think that's one of the modern challenges in terms of uh, of writing crime. It, 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 in a way, if you've got all the things that you that we all use today, to help you, it makes it makes life a lot easier and and a, and a lot more that is internalised in the protagonists and the characters' uh, uh, heads, I guess. Because you know, unless you have very stilted conversations like, "Oh, but look, I've just found this on Wikipedia," <laughs> you know, <laughs> from one character to another, uh, which is is not you know not the way it's done. So they yeah, they're each... there are so many experts in the group. Mm. You know, that you could pop a question in and have an answer, an accurate answer within minutes. Yeah. Depending absolutely. on the time of day you post. We are yeah. very lucky. Yeah, absolutely. But does that answer your question, Will, about fiction, you know, historical and contemporary fiction? I think it probably does. Good. You seem to have kind of an equal foot in each camp of which you prefer. Um, depending on what you're writing and what you know what you're into in that moment in your research and where you're up to you don't necessarily so. have to have a favorite I, I guess I mean I, I I I guess I like at the moment I like what I'm doing I like the contemporary stuff because I can put history in that as well mm. um uh, and, you, both and, worlds. You, and have the best of both worlds that's right but you can't when you're writing the historical stuff not if you want to be authentic in in any way um, I guess the only way you could do that would be with some someone like Lindsay Davis, for example, and the Falco novels that are set in Flavian Rome. Um, uh, in that, I mean, she's almost got she's almost got a sort of Sam Spade type character in in Falco. Who's I mean, he's not quite walking down these mean streets of the Via Sacra, but it 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 has that sort of feel to it, if you like, which is one of those wisecracking 1940s um, uh, noir, American noir books that were turned into so many of those wonderful films with, you know, Humphrey Bogart and so on. Um, uh, so I think she she gets around it in that way in that she's, she's almost imported a modern sensibility into um, an ancient Roman setting. There's a really rather long comment from Pat, so I'm going to leave that one for now, Patsy, sorry. It's quite a long one, so we've only got five minutes, and I do want you to do a recap in a couple of minutes. Okay. So I'll have a look at that one afterwards. Um, <laughs> Kaz is saying she needs to get hands on a paperback of Oracle, and damn it, Sam, stop making me buy books. No, that's my only job. <laughs> I'm a, I, I sell books, and blooming good books as well. <laughs> um, somebody has asked what other genres would you like to write in would you consider writing in other genres I'll see if I can find out who that is um I don't I don't know I mean I I, I was sort of it, it wasn't my idea to write in contemporary crime yeah. um I, I saw myself very much as a, a writer of historical fiction and it was my publisher who who said to me um look because you know it, I, I wrote two historical adventure stories for, for for young adults, but I mean adults like them as well. And um, and the first one did reasonably well in that I mean it was long listed for a prize, but they didn't sell hugely. And I guess it was a bit of a niche market, you know, thirteenth century Al Andalus, uh, and it, and it wasn't a romance, um, uh, so. It, they didn't sell that well, and I was I was actually talking to the lady who subsequently became my publisher um, at the Clapham Book Festival, which I uh, help organise, and and she said, well, look, why don't you write something more commercially popular? Why don't you write crime? And I sort of said, ha, ha, ha yeah, 
you know, and didn't give it any more thought. And then, um, and then she said, no, really, because if you think about your adventure stories, which she had read, mm. and said, you have jeopardy, danger, suspense, you know, there's usually a mystery to solve of some kind. Why can't you provide all those things, write all those things, but actually set it in a sort of um, a contemporary crime genre? And again, I laughed it off. And it was only when I, I knew that I was going to be laid up for a while in, uh, after having had surgery that I thought, well, OK, I'll, I'll give it a go. So that, that wasn't actually my idea. <laughs> that was somebody else saying, um, you know, why don't you try this? And then I, I, I tried it and I, I enjoyed it. Um, and the other thing I do have to say, a, a, a very good friend of mine, Elizabeth Buchan, who's been writing uh, for a long time, she's very, very successful, um, told me years ago that the nicest authors are the ones who write crime. <laughs> because, I would have you, to agree. <laughs> you know, she, she just said they are. That you said you have some very bizarre conversations with them because they sit around and they discuss types of poison and you know bizarre ways of killing off characters and so on but they are some of them the, the most sociable and the nicest people um and and i have found that so not that i'm saying that writers of historical fiction aren't but um, no I have absolutely found not that, that, i suppose um, i've got far more experience with crime authors than i have with any other so i shouldn't be so general should i shouldn't sweeping <laughs> general general generalization get my words out um it does make me laugh though that uh, myself and um donna morfitt were talking about malcolm hollindrake and he is the loveliest man and we get on really well but i did say i'd never go down a tunnel in yorkshire with him in arrogant there's there's one book with um, a very specific tunnel the name of which escapes me but wow yeah so mm -hmm. um there might be dark alleys i wouldn't walk down with crime writers well, well, you never know whether yours. you'll come out the other end, you see. That's just the thing. I don't know. I don't know. We've only got two minutes left. Um, and we've not got through all of the um, comments, questions. There's still quite a few more. So I don't know how you're going to go about choosing your six winners. And you don't have to do that now. We will. Um, we, we can announce those later. That's fine. Okay. So, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll put all the names into a hat and, and just, just pick out pick out six 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 winners excellent uh, um, can do you I, want to give us a, go on i was going to say can i before we go can i sort of give a shout out to the clapham book festival absolutely um, so you're very closely involved with them so what's your role there um i'm the chair of trustees um right. of clapham writers which is the organization that delivers the the book festival we are completely voluntary we have a huge raft of volunteers who give their time freely we have no money <laughs> but there are a lot of writers involved because there are quite a lot of writers who live around here uh, so we've got we make up for in connections what we what we lack in, in <laughs> professional <laughs> expertise at running festivals um and we're having it this year it was cancelled last year it's going to be on the 16th of october for those of you who live in london uh, it's taking place in clapham but for those of you who don't we're actually live streaming uh, the events or some of the events this year um, so if you want to um, take part in events we've got sir michael moore pergo uh, who of course, of course rose um, oh. warhorse uh, i have um, a collection of michael moore pergo on the shelf at the side of me ah well you'll definitely want to come along to the live stream then he's he's coming along with his um illustrator he's got a new book coming out called when fish is flu and and um the illust i don't know what it's about i haven't seen it um but the illustrator is um a syrian war artist so i think he's going back to the themes that he explored in in warhorse and indeed in several other of his books um so he's coming along and we've also got ben mcintyre who some people may have heard of whose um agent sonia is um uh hitting the short lists of various non-fiction prizes even as we speak and he's coming along uh, probably to talk to my friend Simon Burton, who's the um, who was the political journalist, um, and is now a thriller writer. Um, and we've got those two people um, on on the day, and, and we're, we've got lots of physical events as well. Those are the two live streamed ones during the day, um, and we're running a series of other ones across the year. Um, and if people are interested in the group, they're not they're not crime. Some of them are crime, but not not all of them. Uh, and if people in the group are interested, I'll I'll post when they're happening. And, 
if people want to to um, join in the live stream, then um, uh, you know you're very welcome. Um, uh, and that, and that those two anyway will take place on the 16th of October. The others are, are spread around, spread out a little bit. Fantastic. So that's my yeah. shout out for for Catherine Give Book us a story. recap of your books before we finish. Um, um, well, in, uh, so that people can see what to go and buy. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Well, this is this is our, this is it. Oracle. Um, the tagline is is blood calls uh, for blood, and uh, if you like that, that's representative of of um, one type of very old fashioned type of justice, the sort of um, blood vengeance uh, in which it's an Old Testament justice, if you like, the, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Um, and in part, Oracle touches on the difference between that kind of justice and uh, justice uh, under the law as we now know it uh, with courts and crime and punishment and so on. Um, though uh, it, I, I, I do have to say that that probably makes it sound incredibly boring and worthy. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I hope it isn't. I hope it's exciting and you know gripping and all those sort of things. It absolutely is. I mean, we've talked about this before. We've gone live as well, but yeah, it, it's a fantastic book. Thank you. We were, we um yeah we've discussed various parts that we can't discuss now before people read it, yeah. which makes it tricky to continue with it. Um, have you got plague as well to show? Um, I have. If you just bear with me. <laughs> There we go. That that's um that's plague. That's the first one, um, and that that uh, actually that's an early one. That's a pre-publication copy. Uh, but the tagline on that is "Power is a deadly contagion," uh, because that actually is all about power, um, whereas Oracle is much more about justice. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Julie. It's been a wonderful hour. Oh, well, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I talk much too much and I carry on and go on uh, um, more than I ought to. So um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologise nope, for that. Absolutely not. I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you <laughs> Thank to you. all of the members as well for questions. And um, yes. you'll pop a post in tomorrow with the winners. I will indeed. Uh, if I can have, um, uh, can I keep the list of people's? Um, uh, yeah, um, I'll get that for you afterwards. Brilliant. Thank you. That's You're very welcome. Okay. I'm glad you can do the technology. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs>